What up, folks? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. Do you know what time it is? It's meat o'clock. What time is meat o'clock? All freaking day, folks. All day is meat o'clock. I'm talking about meat for breakfast, meat for lunch, meat for dinner. I like it all the ways. I like it in a pan. I like it in a van. I like it in the sky. I like it in my eye. I love meat. And that's why I love Butcher Box because they send meat to me and to you. Butcher Box is the subscription service that delivers high quality meat and seafood right to your doorstep. Choose from a carefully curated selection of grass fed beef, free range organic chicken, wild caught seafood, and more. And they're throwing in the grilling bundle with everyone's first order. I love a ribeye, nice and thick. I like to do the reverse sear. That's where I put it in my toaster oven, right, on a low, on a, on a wire rack, 240 for 30 minutes, and then I sear it in butter and rosemary on the cast iron after that. It is money. I did that uh, last week with the butcher box. I did a ribeye, I did a strip, and then I sliced them up for me and Hannah during meat quarantine this past week. And I love butcher box because it just gets me that meat right to the door, right there, frozen and ready to go. I just take it, it's there individually, like vacuum sealed. All you gotta do is like earlier in the day, like noon, take it out the freezer, put it on my granite countertop on my kitchen, and then by the time it is uh, start, start cooking time, the thing has come to room temperature and it's ready to cook. Butcher Box meat has no antibiotics or added hormones. It's packed fresh and shipped frozen for convenience, so you can save time on your next grocery store trip. You can customize your own box or go with one of their pre-made boxes. Either way, you get exactly what you want. The beef is 100% grass-fed, free-range organic chicken. The pork raised crate-free, and the seafood is wild caught. It's an unbeatable value at less than $6 per meal on average. So kick off grilling season right with ButcherBox. So sign up at butcherbox.com slash tire and get a free grilling bundle in your first order. What is a grilling bundle? It's two 10-ounce ribeyes, five pounds of chicken drumsticks, and a pack of burgers for free. That's like a lot of meat. Two 10-ounce ribeyes, five pounds of chicken and drumsticks, and a pack of burgers for free at butcherbox.com slash tire to claim this deal. Are you a home mechanic, home wrench, home body man maybe? You ever try to do body work on your own car? I haven't, but if you did, you would probably want to go with Evercoat Body Shop products. Some, you know, you don't need to be a pro. This stuff is easy. Right, you, if you just because you're not a pro doesn't mean you don't want to use what the professionals are using. Evercoat is the number one brand preferred by professionals. Evercoat Body Shop products they're easy to use, right? Whether you're a pro or a DIYer, they've got a ton of products, and one is gonna be right for your project. Evercoat works great on steel, fiberglass, other substrates, and there's just three easy steps: prep, fill and sand. The Perfect Mix Guide makes it easy to get the right ratio of filler and cream hardener. It dries in only about 15 minutes. It sands up to 50% faster than the competition, giving you a flawless finish. Evercoat Body Shop takes the guesswork out of body work, and it's available at Advance Auto Parts stores, so go down to Advance and ask for it by name. There's Advance Auto Parts right by me. I was in it just Yesterday, ask for Advan ask for Evercoat Body Shop at Advance Auto Parts stores. Today, get that project in your garage finished ASAP. And then when you're out driving that car, it can be easy to lose focus or feel exhausted. And then a single mistake can cost a lot. But with the newest Black View Driver Monitoring System dash cams, you can stay safe and on the road. Introducing the Black View AI powered driver monitoring system lineup. 
The Blackview driver monitor camera DMC 200 is available with a choice of three road facing cameras featuring 4K full HD recording or built in LTE. All models support cloud connectivity, making them compatible with the Blackview cloud and fleet tracking services. The driver monitoring camera is designed to reliably detect a range of driver behaviors in diverse circumstances. The DMC 200 can accurately recognize drowsiness, distraction patterns, and more. In the case of drowsiness, which is the most critical status to track, the camera includes two alert levels. In addition to the real-time alerts, including beep sound and blinking LEDs, the DMC 200 generates notifications and driving reports as long as the camera is connected to the Blackview cloud. But that's not all. While the driver monitoring features are the DMC camera's main focus, the wild wide field of view and the image quality of the infrared camera sporting a Sony Starvis sensor make a great option to record the interior of the vehicle as well. Blackview driver monitoring system dash cams are making sure you get to your destination safely. So go to blackview.com slash TST. That's B-L-A-C-K-V-U-E dot com slash T-S-T to learn more about the Blackview DMS dash cam lineup. Use the promo code TIRE, T-I-R-E, to get 10% off any Blackview dash cam and free shipping for orders over $200 at Blackview, B-L-A-C-K-V-U-E dot com slash T-S-T to learn more about the Blackview dash cam lineup. Blackview dot com slash T-S-T. And, of course, if you want to get on the action, get in on the Smoking Tire podcast, support your show, and get added features and bonuses, uh, Patreon is where it's at. Patreon.com slash The Smoking Tire Podcast is where you can listen to our live stream, ask questions to us for the crew shows and of our guests. You can get the show rather than on the Tuesday, Thursday schedule, get it the very day that it's recorded. You can even get an extra, you get an ad free. You don't have to listen to these. This whole ad, you wouldn't even be hearing it right now. If this was on, a, if you were a patron, you wouldn't literally be listening to this ad right now. And of course, get a ninth podcast every month, an extra show just for being a patron. Go to patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast to join today. All right, folks, this episode of the podcast is a crew show. I finally give my review of the Nissan Z that I've been sitting on forever. Zach and I have collectively done a thousand miles in the lucid air. I am riding the BMW F850 GS 40th anniversary motorcycle and a whole lot of your questions. It's a crew show, the Smoke and Tire podcast. Hello, everybody. I'm having tea Hello. today because I lost my voice last night because it was because it was loud, and I'm apparently that guy now. <laughs> like, can you turn it down? It was, it was, it was really loud, right? In yeah, there? They it was were, like, hard. Really bumping fucking music in there. You had to yell talk a little bit. You had to yell talk yeah. for sure. So I just kept thinking of that meme where the girl is looking bored and the guy's screaming in her ear about yeah you about know, NFTs downforce or the uh, the moon swatch or it, downforce. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. That was. It pretty much. It's got five thousand pounds of downforce. <laughs> yeah. Um, for the video audience, in case I know what you're thinking, and yes, I am wearing the same overshirt as the last show. Uh, Whatever. Yeah, I I left it hanging over the back of my desk chair, and I put it back on. You're like morning. Mr. Rogers, like that's your podcast sweater, right? It's very this shit. This fucking Faraday shit is real comfortable. It's very soft. Looks comfy. Yeah, it is super. It's some. It's between a shirt and a jacket. It's more than a uh, shirt, but less than a. A light coat. Okay. I'm feeling it. N not a girl, not quite a woman, not yet a woman. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let me tell you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fucking, it's so soft. Who goes around feeling material? It's so soft. I know, if I, if I was a <laughs> that woman, that would soft. be like real condescending. Yeah, it's like, very soft. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, uh, but yeah, so my voice is fucked. Zach's is a little fucked too, actually. Yeah, a little scratchy. Yeah, because it was, it was my first... I had to do so much talking, yes. But the last two days, I had to do more talking than I'd done in a week. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, when your whole job is talking it's and you get, like, COVID, the recovery is hampered a little bit by your talking. Yeah. 
Well, I always used to think like, why do musicians do vocal warm ups? I was like, that doesn't make sense. I can talk all the time and yeah. it's fine. But then when you actually talk for like seven hours straight, yeah. your voice scratches at the end, you're like, that's why. Yeah, I mean, I started yesterday morning by doing 20 minutes to myself in a lucid, you know, and then had like a work day and then finished the day by two hours of screaming at people over really loud music. Yeah, because um, we were at the Hoonigan launch party yes. for uh, for Ken's Pikes Peak. In case people don't know why we were screaming. We yeah, were yeah, no, we were screaming because everyone's an asshole. No, yeah. we were screaming because we were at... Uh, we were at EDC, but we were trying to have conversations. <laughs> right. Uh, studio downtown, uh, Ken and uh, the Hoonigan team uh, revealed their, their new car for Pikes Peak. It's called the Hoona Pegasus. And I love these guys. Love Ken, love Brian, love all the guys who work for them. They're not gonna like this. But I think the Huna prefix has jumped the shark. This name does not really roll off the tongue. Huna Pig is is okay because it's, it's not shorter. Great. It's not Huna great. Pegasus is just too many. So let's go back to the beginning. Coasters. Huna Corn. Mm-hmm really is a great name. Well, because it's like unicorn. Because it's like unicorn, right? right. Th- these kinds of names need a, a double entendre, and that one, like whoever came up with that, because it's like a horse with the Mustang, but it's a one of one, so it's a unicorn, so it's a unicorn. Like that is fucking A-plus senior thesis graduate level marketing degree Naming, yeah, that's yeah. You would get an A at Harvard Business School in your graduate level marketing class for that fucking name alone. Like that's really, really genius. But then they've applied it to all this other shit, where it's unsuccessful. Like, uh, what are the other ones? There's Huna truck, the Huna truck, which is just. It's, well, it's just Hoon Plus Truck. It's just Hoon Plus Which, Truck. Which, like, that is their brand. Their brand is Hoon again. So right, right. I get why they do it, but it's like they came out with such a banger. Yeah. And it fit, and it wasn't just the name of the brand attached to it. wasn't Hoonistang. Yeah. You know? Right, they right, went, right. They found something that was really good. Yeah. Right. And then the electric one, Hoonatron, which is okay because it's e tron, and it's, but. Still, but now we've stuck Pig on there, and because of the Mobile One thing, it's Pigasus. Um, I think the I think that naming scheme has jumped the shark, but it's, I'm sorry to say that I hate to be that guy. I'm not. I I I think the car is really cool. I think Brian and Ken and Thaddeus and everyone who's on their team is cool. Yeah, yeah. And I like what they're doing. I like what their head is at. But I think the naming scheme has jumped the shark. When Thaddeus told me the name of it, I was like, "Let's not speak that word again. It's not a good <laughs> word." Nevertheless. Uh, car built by BBI Autosport. It is a tube frame race car, fundamentally. Yeah. But it does have a VIN number. It has it has a front bumper, a dashboard, and a roof from a 1972 Porsche 912. And what that means is you could put a plate on it. Yeah. It's which technically is street legal. That is crazy. That is really testing the limit <laughs> of what a DMV. Any DMV in the state will, or right. in the United States will do, and it's pre seventy two, so there's no inspection or anything. You just you get a plate and you're good to go. <laughs> Thank and God. I was talking to Brian <laughs> Scotto last night, who was like, "I really want to put a plate on it and drive it around and make a bunch of videos. Like, look what's street legal." But he's like, "That's the kind of thing that would get someone at DMV to change the law, you know, and fuck everybody Ooh, else." It's kind of a good point. I don't. I mean. I think it probably wouldn't. I think, I mean, there's people who go on the Hot Rod Power Tour with five second fucking drag cars that somehow have plates on them, you know? That's true. But, and that hasn't made gotten a law changed. But I think the difference is this would probably get, if this was framed as look what's street legal, it would get picked up by other blogs like, right. look what is street legal. We reached out to the DMV to ask how and why. Yeah. And then it like, because that's what journalists would do, which is fine, but that would, like, I think, blow the story up more. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it was built in order to take advantage of this particular no. law. No. I just, like, that's just, I wouldn't title the video that, but I would get the plate. <laughs> <laughs> you never know when you got to transport that bitch somewhere and a trailer's not available. Very true. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's crazy. It, it is basically a tube frame race car that has some parts of. 911 or 912 actually stuck to it. Um, 355 tires, all four corners, stretched uh, wheelbase, 
stretched both lengthwise and widthwise. Dude, it's so wide. I didn't know the tire width until you just said it, but when I was standing, I knew it was square stance. They don't look like 355s. They yeah. look narrow. Yeah. Holy so, shit. And what, what, if you're looking at the photo, and, and one thing to really notice about the photo that I think is very interesting uh, is to look at the wheels, which are rotiform center lock wheels. Mm -hmm. What is interesting about the wheels is how wide the car is and the fact that there's no offset. There's no dish yep. on the wheel. And what that means is, from a sp suspension geometry standpoint, the, the, the hubs are all the way out. They're at the outside. It's not, it's not a standard width or even a slightly widened chassis with just big, fat, fucking wide tires on it like you see in a lot of the RWBs and a right, lot of right. these Liberty Walk cars where they do a wide body but they don't change the geometries, they just put a big dish. Right, so your pressure point, or the right. end of your lever, right. like, is, is the stopped. hub. It's, yeah. not the, it's not, there's no flex between the hub and the wheel, right. creating a almost artificial, to use, to not have a better term, artificial uh, point of leverage. Right, so in this case, and, and it's actually, BBI makes a pre-RWB suspension package, so if you're gonna do an RWB kit, they have a, package at BBI that changes your geometry so you end up with this Whoa. or something you know something like this where so the point is if you if you move those wheel hubs further out you lengthen all the control arms and it gives you more precise control over your shocks mm -hmm. you can yep. precision tune them and the car will ride drive and handle uh N not like a shitty tuner car. It'll handle yeah. like a car that was designed that way from the factory with a really a lot of a uh, very precise control. Well, because something I learned from that um, the engineering book Tune to Win is all about this, and it's like the shorter your control arms, the larger the change in your camber is going to be as right. the wheel moves. You know, as you go through compression, and like even if you moved it to an infinite length, it would still change that slightly. But the longer the control arm is, the less you have a change in camber. Right. So the more controlled you are and the more predictable the car is. Right, exactly. And so that's that's something, when people go, why does it have to be so wide? It's not just that it's wide, it's that it's wide and the suspension is pushed out to that width. Um, and so there's that. And then you've got, um, it's a, the engine is uh, based on a GT3, a modern GT3 engine, four liter, water cooled, twin turbo, uh, 1400 horsepower. It runs, it said meth fed. Now I don't know if, they, if it runs on methanol or if it's water meth injection. Um, I'm not really sure. It definitely runs on fucking race gas at the very least. Why wouldn't you run on race gas at that yeah, point? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's all-wheel drive. It, it's, it's got the same Sedev all-wheel drive gearbox transfer case set up as the Hunicorn has. Um, and that's kind of, that's also kind of why it has that, that similar rear squat uh, stance. Um, and it's got a lot of fucking wing on it. Dude, the wing is gigantic. It yeah. Has, someone said it told me it has 5,000 pounds of downforce, you know, at, at whatever speed, which is... Crazy because the car weighs like twenty four hundred pounds, um, and it has all kinds of clever stuff. So the the suspension and uh, is GPS controlled, kind of like the Range Rover I drove, but way yeah. more sophisticated. So it knows what corner is coming up, and it knows the optimal suspension setting for that corner. Yeah, prepares the car, and then you go around to that, and then it goes, all right, what's coming up next? So I mean, like, that's actually a much. That's not as complicated as it sounds. Like in the Range Rover and Rolls Royce does this as well. It, it's doing it in an open world environment. When you've only got a 14 mile road to work with, Program it. that's actually, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's awesome. I'm not trying to downplay it, it's pretty cool. But like, when you've just got 14 miles to work with, it's far easier to program those things into a car than it oh, is true. in a I don't complete know open world environment. Well, they said GPS, so I don't know if it just reads the road and then knows what to do, mm -hmm. or if it's programmed for each corner. No, it's, pro it's definitely programmed if it's Jeez. GPS. It knows what to do on, based on a map, and then it knows where you are oh, that's on right. the map. Because the height is variable right. based on that as well, which right, is it can, pretty it, crazy. It can adjust for the yumps, it can adjust for to breaking, heavy braking zones, and stuff like that. That's yeah. Pretty. I mean, that's fucking. It's pretty clever. awesome. Yeah, it's very yeah, clever. Yeah. I've I've never in I've never used it in one of the open world setups where I've really noticed it. Like I've used it in the Rolls Royce. I've used it in Range Rover, mm -hmm. but I've never really 
noticed what was going on, which I think is probably the idea. Yeah. Rolls Royce are advertised a thing where the it would select your gear based on the transmission programming was GPS based, which I Whoa. thought was really bizarre. I never noticed that, but like you're not. There's no gear indicator on a Rolls Royce. It's just D. So like, how the fuck would you know anyway? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's hard because the Range Rover just cornered very flat, but it also has the 48 volt system mm-hmm. that activates as you go through a corner with all the different sensors. So it's hard. It's hard to separate what is happening based on yaw and uh, G force and what is being controlled by GPS. Right. But, I mean, I think that's the point. Is the just, Audi just system nice... has the same kind of 40 48 volt, but it's not GPS. It's based on cameras in the bumper that read, you know, the 10 feet of road yeah. ahead of you. And that seems superior to me because if you're on a bumpy road and yeah. the, G- the GPS knows the curvature, but it doesn't know what the surface is. Right. Um, but if you've only got 14 miles you need to program, you know, you could spend a day or two scouting the road and right. make notes and program it. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty fucking crazy, this car. It is. It uh, it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't look like... Uh, most Porsches you've seen before. It's no, pretty. It's pretty aggressive. It's um, yeah, it is. The shape. I like the shape in the back. It it reminds me a little bit of Cayman, just because I think they extended this tail so much, mm-hmm. and uh, it looks like a little bit of a cartoon Porsche, but it looks really uh, tough and very cool. Apparently, it would cost about one point eight million to recreate. What? Yeah, I did not. Wow, my estimate was way under that. Yeah. Holy crap. That's to recreate, not to create. Yeah. To do another one knowing what's already been done. That's what it would cost to do a second one. Holy, my mouth is a gate mm-hmm. for the audio listeners. I am in disbelief. That is, I mean, it's not, wow. it's not like that out of the question. Everything on that is handmade. Yeah, I know, but I mean, that's just a lot. I guess I don't actually know how much race cars and unlimited cars tend to cost. So, that much. I guess it's that much. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's wow. a reason the top class is sponsored typically by manufacturers. Right. Or, you know, it's not, you know, there's there's cars that people build in home garages and small shops that run Pikes Peak, but they don't look like that. No, they don't. No, I mean, but what's crazy is that about Pikes Peak is the unlimited class, there are people that build the shit in their garage. And yeah, these, yeah. And then this could also run against Bentley or Volkswagen. Right. And there's just like how many zeros do you have to add at the end of your check? Yeah. Yeah, so Whoa. this thing is uh, is pretty fucking cool. I mean, yeah. it's, I'm excited. I'm excited to watch it uh, run up there and hear it and all that stuff. I hope it works because as of last night, uh, the engine was not actually in the car. Yeah, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a car reveal if the car actually worked. So as of last night, that car is a display car, uh, and but Tim said the engine almost runs. <laughs> like, you know, he's got what? I'm, uh, four five weeks. Four weeks. Yeah, five weeks. Five weeks. Yeah. No problem there. Whew. Crunch time. Mm-hmm. Um, I I really hope it works out because it's just a very exciting thing, you know? Yeah. And we're friends with these people. Like, we want to see them succeed and give it a shot. And he's racing. They're racing against, you know, Batim's ex-business partner, Joey Seeley, uh, with with a car that uh, Reese Millen is driving. That's um, a, It's a cup car-based product, right? It's like a turbo... Turbo Cup. What, what do we? I don't know what he's calling it. What's he, what's Joey I think it is something like that. It's like a GT3 Cup car, but it's turbocharged. But it's got, so it's got tw- four fifteen hundred horsepower yeah. and uh, um, emotion engineering. Uh, let's see what what does the what is he calling this thing? He was up at Willow Springs uh, testing it. It looks much more. Uh, I mean, it looks aggressive, but more normal. It looks more like a modern uh, Porsche race car. I don't want to insult Joey by calling it more normal because it's pretty extreme. It's been widened. It's got massive uh, fender flares in uh, the front and the rear, and uh, very aggressive uh, looking car. But a, a modern um, GT2 Club Sport, you know, based uh, product. Mm-hmm. Jesus, look at the exhaust on that fucking thing. Um, oh, yeah, go. Go to Emotion underscore Engineering if you want to check out. Uh, Photos of this. Does it say? Uh, does, can you scroll down on the thing there? Does it? Does it say what the? Doesn't say what the specs are. Mm, yeah. Here you go. So, GT3, GT2. I don't know. That, yeah, it's it's a fucking race car. There's it's a no modern nine yeah. nine one or nine nine two based uh, race car. I think it's a nine nine one Cup car based uh, car. 
that's just got like a zillion horsepower right. and a whole bunch of fucking downforce. I mean, there's no regulations in this class. I mean, I'm sure there are some rules. Yeah, but and, like... and 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 <clears throat> Joey, I don't think is going for style points. You know, like Ken has a whole like brand that's that's you know, they got to do the thing that's the Ken thing. You know, but, but Tim built the car, but Tim built the engine. But creatively, that project is driven by Ken and his you know art team. You right, I which mean? I, I mean, I do appreciate that. They want to make sure it's as visually impactful as it is fast. And what they said yesterday, what Scotto said, is it was kind of like the Hunicorn seems fast, but what if we actually take the knowledge we have of that car and then put it into building a race car? So it's going to be a little bit more extreme, whereas this is like you take a club, you know, GT3 club, and yeah. then you take all the rules away. Yeah, yeah. What would you shove in there? Yeah, that's pretty much it. So we're going to Pike's Peak. Uh, we're going to be recording shows. People have asked us to like meet up. People have asked us like, "What's your schedule? What are you doing?" And I'm like, "I have absolutely no fucking clue. I literally have no idea what we're doing." I will reread the schedule, but from what I remember last time, basically what we would do is, uh, you know, there are the the practice days leading up to the race, and you just choose which one of those you want to go to with immediate pass. But once you go to that one, you can't change for that day. So right. like you go, we're going to go to Devil's Playground parking lot today, mm -hmm. and we're going to be there from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh -huh. Because after practice over like 9.30, everyone goes back down. So those days are short. And then the next day we go, well, now we want to be at the start because we want to see it or our friends that we want to talk to are going to be down there. Yeah. And then we're like, all right, well, that's what we're doing for this morning. And okay. that's pretty much how it works. Yeah. And then on race day, you can we would want to be at the start because that's the full grid and they have a screen where you can watch the race but if you're if you're up on the mountain on race day you cannot come down until like 3 p.m yeah and that's, that's a rough. very long day it's a very 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 long day what are their rules regarding i mean i you can't like can you can i run a fucking grill up there am i allowed to like grill meat i think open so. flame rules uh, or we have to buy like an electric, like a foreman grill kind of situation. Uh, but I think people run like Coleman stoves or something. Okay. I mean, I don't know if you'd have like a, a wood barbecue. But once you're above tree line, yeah, I guess it doesn't I mean. Matter. But uh, can you start a fire above tree line? No, it'd be challenging. So yeah. you, I think running propane or something like that is the yeah. move. Or an electric one would be the most sure like, fire way. Right. Yeah, something you that just figure out how to cook plug food. in hot plate. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're gonna have a Raptor. I assume that has a 110, but I don't know if you can run. I think it does. Uh, an, um, what's it called? Induction. Induction off of it. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We're going to have to figure that out. I'll, but we're I'll, gonna be, I'll plan some schedule and show it to you, and we can figure but it out. But, yeah, we're going to be recording shows. But, like, and, like, if you're going to Pike's Peak, if you've got tickets, if you please, like, say hi. Like, see us, stop us, stop, say hi. Like, uh, we're not, I'm not trying to be antisocial, but I literally cannot make plans with you because I you don't know where things are, when things are, where we're going to be. And we are, we are going to like enjoy ourselves, but we're also going to, to do work. Mm -hmm. And like, I can't promise to hang out with anybody because we have like things to do, but like, yeah, it's a I pretty restrictive situation. Huh? It's a restrictive situation due yeah. to the safety concerns. So we might be five miles up the mountain and you might be at the bottom and like, that's just how it's going to be for that yeah. day. Yeah, like people have been like, can I come watch the race with you? And I'm like, I don't even know where I'm going to be. But I assure you that wherever we are, we're going to be doing shit. So, yeah. Race probably. day, I think we'll be at the bottom. Yeah. That's, yeah, where everything's happening. Okay. Um, talk about the new Z. Didn't get around to that really yesterday uh, or on Monday Correct. with Spinelli. Uh, Z reviews are out. I would recommend if you haven't gotten around to it to watch either of our two videos. I did a, I did a road drive in the manual. Uh, the red car. I did a track, uh, just the noise in the automatic car. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 two cars are otherwise the same. They're uh, they're per both performance pack cars. Um, the automatic was not great. It was fine at six or seven tenths. Um, if you're really going to spend your life sitting in traffic or commuting to work and occasionally have a drive through the canyons or something or on a nice road, the automatic is probably fine. Um, if you are looking for a very responsive automatic that will listen to everything you want it to do and and be, be able to be pushed to the limit, such as on a track, I would skip it. It's not particularly good mm. um, at that. I mean, I drove immediately after the Z, I drove the Kona N. 
uh, which we have a video coming out, and the DCT in the Kona N is way better and more responsive than the Z, and the Z is $16,000 more. Was the Z the same automatic that we had in the Q60? Basically. Right, yeah. okay, yeah. It needs a lot of cushion yeah. on the downshifts. The, 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 the responses to the paddles are so lazy that people thought the video was out of sync. They were like, your video's out of sync. I was like, what do you, it's not. I'm looking, I'm looking and my mouth matches the, the, and they're like, yeah, but you tug the paddle and then the sound, I go, that's, that's, the car is out of sync, Whoa. not the fucking video, homie. You give me a heart attack. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. I checked. Someone said it's out of sync and I'm like, let me check. Not the car. That's wow. the car. Yeah, that's the delay. Now, the automatic isn't all bad in, in terms of, uh, acceleration it's obviously quicker than the manual it has launch control and it will light up the f light up first gear bark second gear and chirp third gear wow so the upshifts if you're on the floor are aggressive and snappy but as i've said over and over and over and over and over and over and over upshift for show downshift for dough it's a thing I, you get it from golf drive for show putt for dough mm -hmm. and the upshift times are what everybody brags about. Oh, we've shortened it by 50 milliseconds or whatever. But then on the downshifts, if it doesn't listen to you, if it needs a huge cushion of revs, if it's lazy, well, what the fuck are you bragging about? <laughs> like you're bragging about one half of the gearbox. I think you know? the, the metric you're using will work on people that are not driving in canyons or as focused as we are, but right. for a lot of the population that's interested in the Z, they are gonna track it, they do wanna drift it, they do wanna do that stuff, yeah. and downshift's really important. Yeah, and and the manual is good. Like, I drove a 370 while I was there. The 370 shifter was rubbery, very vibrate -y. it was not particularly engaging, it was not what I would call a good manual. By 20, you know, by 2009 standards, it was fine. By 2022 standards, not great. This is much crisper. Um, it's it's got just the right amount of effort. It's got really easy notches and gates. It could be someone's first manual without it being a problem. It's got a very easy one button physical button rev matching toggle nice. on off. How um, would the 370Z's manual compare to like the new M4 in terms of the, the new M4 is stuff? better than the, three, the 370, but not by a ton. The 371 was pretty, okay. it was pretty mushy. Like our BMWs, E46s have better manuals than the 370. Wow, okay, the last one I drove was like 2012. So. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's not great. The new one is pretty good. Whatever they've done, whether it's bushings or a new shifter assembly, the gearbox itself is the same. They have, you know, so, but whatever they've done with the shifter, it does feel much better when I went back to back. It looked, and I'm, I'm gonna, it, you know, asterisk looked, uh, the, some of the B-roll I used from Nissan that I put in the video, it had basically just the engine transmission floating in black space. Yeah. And it looked like the shifter was rod actuated. So that would increase the feel a ton over a cable actuated system. Did, was the 370 cable? I don't know. I don't. I just. I don't know. I saw if this it was. floating in space thing. I, I believe it that yeah. it's rod actuated. That makes sense, but I don't know if that's what they changed. Um, the, you know, the power is is linear. There's plenty of it. Um, the car, um, uh, well, Camisa did the numbers with zero to sixty in the low fours, the quarter mile in the mid twelves. For for a stock car under fifty grand, that's plenty of performance. Um, it feels when you're driving it like a quick car. Um, the, the handling is is a good balance between the kind of uh, suppleness and body roll that you'd want from an everyday street car and something you can have fun with. If you want to go on a track days, you know, not just go to a track day, but really do track days, or if you want this to be a focused weekend performance type car, you may want to do one of the very many aftermarket suspension setups that are going to be coming out for this thing. I'm not saying slam it on the ground, but like maybe a higher end shock, maybe a little bit stiffer of a spring. Like um, it's got, I mean, I, I, the, I only drove, I drove performance pack cars except for one go on an ex, a straight line acceleration run for a non PP car. Mm, okay. The performance pack you get is 10 grand. You get better wheels and tires, better brakes, uh, a limited slip diff, um, the front front and rear lip, um, 
an increased top speed, 10 mile an hour increased top speed. I think it's probably worthwhile. I mean, for us, the LSD is worth yeah. quite a bit of money. And then, I mean, the better brakes, like starting with better factory brakes that all you need to do is like pads and fluid or something. The track you cars need we drove yeah. the had Nismo dealer available track pads okay. on them. And they were fine. They're $475. You can get them from a Nissan dealer. Stock fluid. They said they tested, and even for Nevada, they did not need to do a dot five fluid. It was this, a standard fluid, but with a Nismo track pad. Okay. Um, Sounds pretty good. The uh, just real quick, the 370Z was um, not cable actuated, but a lot. But these forums are talking about how the feel was terrible. And yeah. Some people clarify, like, or explain why it was terrible. It's just a lot of slop in the overall system. Yeah. Um, whatever they've done, the manual is quite nice. Nice. I mean, it's. It's not like Civic Type R or GT3 level, but it's better than what BMW is doing right now. Um, it's probably about the same level as like the GM stuff, like the ATS-V manual. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of like that. Okay. Yeah, it's it's good. Yeah. It's right behind the very best. Like, and it's good. It's it's good for what they're for the amount of money they want for this car. More than acceptable. The only it's a little small for me. Um, I'm a little big. Mm -hmm. um, if you're over six feet, if you're over 250, don't buy one without sitting in it first. Um, I had trouble with a helmet. I wouldn't want to do a bunch of track days in one. Um, I, ha I was fine for a couple hours on the press drive. I wouldn't want to draw own one because I just don't. I'm just a little too big. It's just a little too. I wouldn't want to do a five hour road trip in one. Um, just a little too small for me. Because well, you said your head was almost touching the roof. and so, Without a helmet. Right, without a helmet. Yeah. So, I mean, if I sat in there with a helmet, even I would have only like, yeah. you know, two inches of room or so. Yeah. Right? And when I'm driving on a track, I like to sit pretty straight up, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And so I had to I had to do that, the crunch down. The Viper seating. The Viper seating to get a helmet on. So my seating position on the track was not optimal. So, but that's me. I mean, a lot of people use me as a fit model for for these tons of cars. So if you're 6'3", 250 plus, I would maybe not not consider this one. But otherwise, I mean, they've done a nice job. It's And, and like I said on the show with Spinelli, and I'll, I'll repeat myself if you heard that show, but if not, it's very important to Nissan. It's also very important to me that this car is not a twin. It's not it's not also a Ford Capri. Mm -hmm. It's not all, you know what I mean? The, 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 the Supra objectively on paper may be very similar to this car. The base one, the base Z has 400 horsepower. The base Supra is a four cylinder. So there's like some paper, but like I give a shit about numbers and paper way less than some other people do. Some people really care that this car has 385 horsepower and that one has 400 mm -hmm. as if it really fucking matters. It right. does not. What matters to me is that the, a sports car, which is an emotional purchase, even if it's your daily driver, has a character that is self-representative and that you can relate to. Now, whether or not you relate to the Z, I don't. I, I don't care. That's your. That's you. That's a you. Do you relate to it? Do you not relate to it? The most important thing is that the Z is a Nissan. It's not also a Toyota. The you know the the Supra is a fucking BMW. Fully, they didn't even change the fonts. You know it. So and that's a car where like the exterior you know has I think sports car character to me. But when you get in it and start driving and start using everything, that character is is BMW character. Yeah, and then. You lose the practicality of the back seat, which you know it's based the, the car it's based on has like, and then you just you're like, what? Why am I sacrificing all these things to have the same experience as a BMW driver? Yeah. Same maintenance, same all that, all those things. Yeah, basically, and then same thing with the eighty sixes. The 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 that car's a Subaru. I mean, in all the ways that it matter, it's a Subaru. Like it feels it. The engine revs it. And you start it. You go. That's a flat. That's mm -hmm. a Subaru engine. You know, and so. Just fine. Buy the Subaru version, or you know, I don't, I don't really care which one you buy. But like, 
the comparison isn't, well, the turn-in is slightly better on this, and this one has slightly more power. It's like, that Toyota is a BMW, and this Nissan is a Nissan. It celebrates the heritage of the Z with subtle and not-so-subtle styling de- styling cues, but it hasn't gone overboard into corny land with it. True, um, yeah. And, um, and, and it's... It's its own thing. It's not a shared platform. You know, the, um, the quote, compromise, the business case, is that they've carried over the fundamental platform from the last car. But if you were to get in it and drive it, particularly if you don't have a 370 on hand right now to go back to back, it feels like a new car. It doesn't mm-hmm. feel like an old car. It feels like a new car. I mean, twin turbo engine, revised shifter, electric power steering, totally new interior. It, it feels like a new car. There's little shades of the 370 here and there, but you only really notice them if you've either got a 370 on hand to go back to back or if you've got a lot of experience with the 370. Otherwise, it feels like a new car. So, I mean, it's the same wheelbase, same dimensions, uh, or same track dimensions as the 370, right? It's just a, a slightly longer car, uh, but it's not like the, the weight distribution distribution's probably the same. It, yeah, I mean, so. but the steering is better. Mm-hmm. The shock, con- the, the suspension control is better. Which you'd the expect because are of better. technology advancements and yeah, stuff, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, they, they've they managed to make it more engaging out of the box. The 370 and the 350, you had to do a couple of key modifications to them in order to make them, like, even acceptable. This one is is fine just how it is. You don't need to modify it. It's fun the way it is. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I wrote 2,000 words for Road and Track. You can go read it at roadandtrack.com. We've got two videos up. You can go watch those. And I think something there might that, be that, some questions in the Patreon about the Z. We can I think there are. Get um, to those later. Something we forget, like, you know, we, they used to have like the 370Z Nismo. A lot of times when there's a successor to a car, they will use parts from the best special mm-hmm. version of the predecessor. So you get those hand-me-downs. And so that's what's so great about like the new car. You know, you don't have to do these modifications that made the last one just merely acceptable because hopefully they've already just been put on the car. I think they went beyond the, the Nismo stuff from the last car. I mean, I think the stuff that's really been improved is is basically all new. I mean... Uh, the steering, the shock setup, the the there's not a they they didn't say that oh the 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 upgraded performance pack brakes are actually the Nismo brakes they they said they were all new so um, that I just think it's lessons they learn whether they use the same parts or not. It's, this car had a five year development cycle. This car was pitched in 2017 um, by um, Tamarasan. So like. Uh, you know, I, I don't. I think they they spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time figuring out what it was they were going to do, and and that doesn't even count the engine. Like they've already had the engine. The engine's right. been around the whole time. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was a very nice car. I mean, for what for what for what they're offering for the amount of money they're offering, um, you know, the Z was never ever in its history a Corvette. No, you know no, it no, was no. Ne- it was never a Porsche. It was like it was always a a, a middle of the road, good looking, high functioning, fun to drive, you know, sports car with value. You know, in the beginning, it was like the value E type, and then it became the value Corvette, and then it became you know, and so. Um, it, I mean, it, it's the Japanese Mustang. It's it's sort of the Japanese Camaro. It's, yeah. it's like it's a good-looking sports car that is affordable to that market, and people should be able to drive it every day and also have fun with it. And then it's a good platform to modify. Which yeah. I mean, Forsberg, other people like the the three fifty Z and three seventy have kind of like they came into their own like six years ago. Everyone went, wait, these are really durable. Have good hardware. They're good for drifting. They're mm-hmm. good for motorsports stuff. Like they're pretty robust if you get like the right VQ, you know, generation. And they used to be dirt fucking cheap, and now they're. I mean, they've definitely gone even before the COVID thing and, and the pricing. Like six years ago, a decent driver was like three to four thousand dollars, and then like four years ago, they were eight because yeah. everyone just went, "Oh, this is this is what we want from BMWs, yeah. but they're more reliable." Yeah. Um, and it's like, and and when great 240s all of a sudden became collectible, yeah. And you go, wow. Well, if I can get a 240 for eight or this 350 for eight, 
why wouldn't I just get the 350? It's, it's twice already the got, horsepower. Yeah, the power. It's smaller. You get wider tires in there. You don't have to put like these janky wide body things on them. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I thought I think I think they've done a nice job. I think they'll sell a lot of cars. Do I think you should go out and spend? a hundred G's to get the first one because of ADM, fuck to the no. I, I, I will say it had, considering how hyped it is online and considering, um, you know, the, the excitement generated by it on the internet with enthusiasts, you would think that more people would have noticed it when I drove it around the streets of Las Vegas. But nobody gave a fuck. It had, and it's not. Doesn't mean it's not good looking. It doesn't mean that nobody noticed. But like, compared to say the Lucid, mm-hmm. where people were, oh, you know, they would stop, point, mouth open, uh, and track you across the street. You know, and yes, I know, understand the Lucid's expensive, but that not. No, but I think the Lucid, the front of the Lucid looks like nothing else yeah, that yeah. is on the road right now. I'm just saying like it had, you should not pay up to be the first person with one of these because the resulting curb appeal will disappoint you. The ability to floss by being the first dude with a Z is much less than you think it is. Well, to the general population, yes, but yeah. to your local cars, you know, car group, car meet, like it'll be higher, but I still agree with you because they're gonna sell a lot of these. Yeah. So buying the first one for that much money over, it's Well, this just, yellow one is it. the launch edition. They're only making 240 of them. Um, it's f- uh, like four grand more than the, the performance pack. And you get the two-tone, you can't really see it in this photo, but it's yellow with a black roof mm. and a black side skirt. And you get the, the bronze, they're not really gold, they're more bronze uh, wheels uh, with the yellow calipers. I mean, those are gonna be the flipper specials. I would not waste money on that. That color is fine, but you know, it's the, a the blue is much better, the and the red's is, nice too. It's like the red's a, it's like a sparkly the blue burgundy. is my favorite. Yeah, and the 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 battleship gray um, I, doesn't it, it wasn't great for a for a YouTube thumbnail, so I didn't want to take mm-hmm. that one. But if I actually owned one, the battleship gray uh, was is pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's just it's just a nice kind of classy. Um, it's not like Porsche chalk. It's got it's more like Lamborghinis. Oh yeah, uh, it is. battleship gray. Yeah. Um, and it's a very kind of tasteful, um, the two-tone roof, I, you know, I forget, I forget if the two-tone roof costs more or the matched paint roof costs more. It's, uh, the two, it's, uh, it's an option. You can choose, there's not a lot of options on this car. You pretty much just choose your performance pack or regular color. And then, Mm. and then I think you can choose whether the roof, um, I think you could choose silver or black wheels, and then I think you can choose whether the roof is black or or body color. But I forget which costs more. I mean, in this in this shot, the gray with the black roof looks really cool from the side. I, I like I it. I dig the two I like tone. The, yeah. I like the black roof in in almost all scenarios. I like the black roof. Mm. Yeah, but I forget which costs more. Right. Um, but it was a nice. It's a really nice car. I mean, right in that side profile there, the the hundred and eighty or the 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 broad side profile. You you really understand the 240, right? You get you get 240Z from that side, definitely, profile. especially in the back. The back half, I think. I mean, the back half is the best looking part of the car. But I mean, like, I'm not just saying the rear lights. I I think it's really cool. I think it's the really front cool. looks great when it comes up behind you in the rearview mirror. When you get run up on in the rearview mirror by one of these things, it looks like a 240Z. It looks great. The three-quarter angle, the the squared off mouth is a little too squared off for the rest of it, but yeah. whatever. It, it looks better in in there. That view, that's where you're like, ah, oh, that's that's a Z. Yeah, because I, I got some historic photos from Nissan to put in the video, and like you really see the similarity because that was when they had they enclosed the headlights with plastic. Right, you know, they weren't like uh, you know the early days where it was just a clear plastic cut over out. like the the already existing yeah, head, yeah. headlights, and it does look a lot like this. Um, yeah, it's cool, man. It's They're cool. just fun. They're fun. It's cool. It's a nice car. And if, um, you know, for the amount of money you're spending and the performance you're getting, I think it's a it's a solid value proposition, assuming they're not going to be 25,000 ADM or whatever. Um, funny personal car update. 
Uh, Donnie's getting my door cards back from my Ferrari. If you recall, they were held yeah, on with Bonto tape. and wood screws. So they've been completely recovered in new leather and remade with the correct methods. Um, he wanted me to recover my seats, too, in the matching leather because they won't quite match. It was going to be an extra four grand. And I told him no. And he was like, please. And I was like, no. <laughs> and he was like, but it won't match. And I was like, Donnie, I don't give a shit. Yeah. I don't want new seats. I don't want this car to turn into what I've got with the E46 where I have to get into the seat without accidentally rubbing the bolster. Right. I, I, what I love about the Ferrari is a fucking just plop down in the seat. It's not perfect. The leather's got a few creases in because it. Because if they make the if they make the seats brand new, then by you using it and sitting in it, they will age quicker than the door card, and then they won't match again. So I what's the point? Just I don't care that because they were recovered at some point in the past, and the leather's not the correct leather. I don't give a shit. Yeah, Donnie it's not like it's plastic. It's not like some no one's ever been like your seats are wrong. Only Donnie. Yeah. Um. So I'm not recovering my seats. My, my door cards, for a time, will look newer than my seats. I don't give a fuck. I, I really want this car to be the kind of car I can r put miles and miles and miles and miles on and not be a bitch about it. And part of that is having a seat that is not brand fucking new. Mm -hmm. um, he's also taken my suspension completely apart. Oh, we're doing new bushings. We're doing new shocks. We're doing um, new end links for the sway bars. Does he upgrade the shocks in any way, or no, is it like OEM, new old stock? New OEM. Yeah, they're Coney's. Uh, they're factory factory spec Coney's. It's not new old stock. They're new, right. but it's new to spec. Got it. Um, springs are fine. Uh, I mean, it's a fucking spring. Uh, but the bushings were tired. The bushings were very tired. So they weren't like rattling tired, but like they were, just, uh, yeah. So we're going to be ready for lots of driving in this car. Nice. Um, uh, so you mentioned springs are fine because they're springs. I've, one of my favorite Reddits that I follow is like mechanic advice. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people asking questions. Like they're asking questions, they're trying to learn things, but sometimes the question is so simple, it's amazing. And someone was holding a thing in their hand and they were like, what is this? It just fell off my car. And everyone was like, how did you crack your spring in half? This person's spring had just wow. not even like separated a seam. It had split and cracked, and wow. then like a chunk had fallen off. And I mean, there's some amazing That's stuff pretty crazy. on that subreddit. Yeah, I'm guessing they started by having no shock for a long time. Might have. Yeah, yeah. might be old, rusty car. Yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, funny car update for me. My shit broke. <laughs> I was. I was. And what was amazing about it is I was on the 405 about to exit, and I was talking to Armin who is like our BMW whisper psycho, yeah. you know, he, he was the DP of our eBay show. He's owned more BMWs than anybody I've ever known and continues to shop constantly. And I'm on the phone with him and I like dropped a third and hit the gas and it just kind of goes blah. And I was like, you're not gonna believe what just happened. And uh, he it starts total, howling. Totally turned off. So it turned off at like 45 miles an hour, which I mean, I still had like steering and I tried to start it and it went and blurbed off again. So now I'm just coasting silently, having an electric car experience. Um, luckily, there was no traffic, so I was able to just like take the exit, turn right onto a street, and immediately just park at a curb. And it will all under inertia. All under inertia. Oh wow! Um, thank God that car's not that heavy because steering was like yeah. challenging, but not you know old car with no power steering. When power steering goes out, a problem. And it uh, it'll crank. Electrics turn on, but there's just nothing happening. So the thought is the fuel pump, that you know, sucks. gave in. And, it, uh, and looking at the forums, they were like, this is one of the only parts on this car that can break and will not throw a code. Oh. Like, otherwise you have a code reader, but they're yeah, like, this yeah. is one of the only things, I don't know why, so that you have there's no, no code. code. So there's no code to tell you that's what went wrong, but it's obviously like, it's but if, fueled But the code no would come up if something else went wrong. Right, if yeah, there was yeah. a spark issue, it would tell me, because yeah. I've gotten those before. Yeah, so, uh, God damn this you know, car. I had a strong two months with this, this fucking, fucking hunk of this shit. This fucking car, man. I know, and I still like it, but I hate it sometimes. Is it time to just make this a, a fun yes, weekend car it is. and either modify it further, where reliability is not a concern, or it is do something? One hundred percent time. It? it is poorly timed based on the market, but it's one hundred percent time to find a daily slash backup slash, you know, whatever. Because it's been my everything car for like four years. Yeah, and it's more frustrating that there are these times where I'm like. 
oh great, now I got to lift to the office. I got to you know yeah. steal a press car from you or something. Um, and so I mean, it's fortunate that like the Lucid was around, yep. and for most of the weekend, like I was at home, so you could just take the Lucid, and mm-hmm. we should talk about your thoughts on the on yes. the Lucid. Um, but like. There's a lot of times there's a car, but there's not always a right. car. I had a month where I spent a lot on Lyft because yeah. I could, luckily Lyft exists. I can solve this problem for myself. But um, yeah, it's just time to do that. So yeah, I don't know. so I was I was thinking like you know reliable Jap whatever it's gonna be is gonna be Japanese and either SUV ish or I'm also drawn to the Toyota Matrix with the good engine. Oh, the XRS. Yeah, yeah, XRS is. But they only have, came with a manual. But haven't people figured out that XRSs are a thing yet, or are Matrix is still not cool enough that you can still find? They're them? just rare. Yeah, they're just hard to find. Like yeah. you know whatever uh, Auto Tempest nationwide search like doesn't come up with many. Yeah, I mean so. like the the cross section of people who <laughs> wanted a. Toyota Matrix and who wanted the fucking Lotus engine are like not a yeah, lot. There's seven. <laughs> exactly. So I'm definitely so I'm definitely starting the shop. I think it process. might be it might be LS four hundred time for you. I do like that car. LS four hundreds are still where it's at. They are very good. Yeah. And I would like to I would if whatever I get needs to have some ground clearance, both for Los Angeles and for whatever else. So I could LS four hundred with a little bit of a rally suspension. LS four hundred so. Safari? Yeah. The LS four hundred Safaris that I've seen only use like, like sp- I don't know what the term is. It's probably wrong, but like spring, spring lift. Spacers. That's a real thing. Yeah, that's pretty much what they use. So I, it might ride like that Crown Vic. That, I don't want that. Which you don't, yeah. you don't, wouldn't want. Yeah. Uh, there might okay. be a way to do it, but well, um, that's where we're at with that. I mean, Vinny is on his way to Los Angeles as we speak, and he can find things. He is the used car. Safe. Yeah, I mean, I mean he's he the found divining that, he rod. Got that QX4 that was really clean for like five grand. And the, mean, that, the Pathfinder based the, that, that was the QX4. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. amazing. Yeah, that and thing was super great. Clean. He's had a, been that. through a couple of Land Cruisers. He's been through a few different uh, things. Maybe I'll ask him for assistance because he's yeah. really good at finding clean. He, he cheap finds shit. a lot of Japanese stuff like that. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. And there might, I mean, maybe, well, I, I don't think you should get something that's actually from Japan because. It's no. um, the the finding if even they're, even if they are mostly reliable, like finding parts for that kind of shit sucks. I don't want to play that game. Yeah, I just the POW that ha- we got for Hannah <clears throat> is lovely, um, and but but it's it's nobody's fault. Um, somehow it slipped through the cracks when it had the major service at Fontana Nissan that the battery was on its way out. They, the PPI that I had on the East Coast, the guy told me the battery was on its way out. Oh, okay. And I'm pretty sure at some point I told the the Fontana Nissan guys that, that it needed a new battery. But it cranked up so fast. I was there when it, they started. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was But it boom. didn't die right. then and there. Right. And, and it just, it somehow slipped through the cracks and they didn't put a new battery in. So it was at the house and the battery died. And I was able to jump it using one of the little portable guys. It jumped in like right away. So it wasn't like, the deadest, but I was like, okay, I need a new battery. All the writing on this fucking battery is in Japanese. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't, fi- I'm going on forums. I can't. I just can't figure out what the fucking battery is. I emailed Torchinsky, who's got a POW. He's like, I think it's some kind of motorcycle battery, which it turns out that was wrong. Mm-hmm. I love Jason, but it turns out that was not correct. A motorcycle battery might work because it's a one liter engine, right. but th- it, that wasn't it. <laughs> Brad you Brownell, that one thousand RR battery. Yeah, for it. Brad Brownell just got a uh, a Figaro, which mm-hmm. is very similar. Yep. And I asked him, I go, what what kind of battery do you have? And he sent me a picture of the top of his battery. I I, I could not find this fucking thing for the life of me on the internet. And I realized it was because this brand of battery is also from Japan, even though it's named in English. <laughs> uh, so I um, I figured out it was battery group 151R. That's like the the battery group is the, the size and shape of your battery. Okay. That's how you find. And there's like so many fucking options, right? So it's one. It's it's a weird battery. It's probably this tall. It's probably like. 10 inches tall, right? And it's probably five by six wide. So it's 
small. It's like two thirds the length and width of a regular battery, but it's like much taller yeah. than a regular car battery. And the reason I wanted to buy the same size battery is because it has a metal, you know, tie down thing that comes with the car. And I didn't want to just like zip tie the thing. I wanted to actually have it be the right one. So I figured out. You're okay, not a real Nissan enthusiast. Right. I figured out it was one for the. So I get this battery and it's a diehard battery and it looks exactly the same. But I put it in and then I realize the posts on the Japanese battery are like really small. They're like half the size of a regular car battery post. Well, and weren't they like conical? Didn't they narrow at the top? They were a little bit conical, but it was more about the fact that they were just much thinner. Okay. And so I went back to Advance Auto Parts and I said, okay, this battery physically fits. This is the right size battery, but the posts are smaller. And like three people there were like, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. And they're like, what kind of car is it for? And I'm like, you've never heard of it. And they're like, Try me. And I'm like, a Nissan POW. They're like, yeah, yeah, we've never heard of it. I was like, okay. But then one guy comes out of the back and he was like, did you say small posts? And I was like, yeah, small posts. And he goes, I think I have something for you. And takes me in the back. Turns out a Prius battery uses small posts. Second gen Prius Mm -hmm. battery has like half size posts. And it also turns out it's the exact size and shape of the battery that I need. But the terminals are reversed, so I had to put it in the uh, put put it in the right way. But the terminals are on the other side of the battery, so I had to like cut all the zip ties holding all these cables together and like rouch. I did a thing. I did. But thankfully, you had enough cable. Like the cables I weren't had cut an, perfectly. No, that they were. I had enough cable to move it to the other side, and and I just had to like undo some of the bundles of wires and then re-zip tie them afterwards. Nice. But like. I learned that a Prius battery is actually the correct And that is battery. an easy part to find. Act now that I fucking know. Right. But you'd think on the forums or somewhere or somewhere on the internet, they'd be like, oh, hey, by the way, a, a Prius battery works. Huh. I mean, yeah. how many how many POWs are in America, United States? Seven? A few hundred, maybe. Okay. So, yeah, not a lot. Uh, so the batteries, lot. maybe just everyone bought them. They lasted a while. I don't know. It's just yeah. not a common issue. Yeah. So we're good to go there now. That's cool. Um, so while, while your car was broke, you drove the Lucid. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think? Uh, the ride is excellent. Yeah. The handling, which I like, I mean, I was on the freeway most of the time, but like just taking some off ramps. And I drove in the canyons with you before. Like the handling impressed me, especially when combined with the ride. Like it, it corners fairly flat, but without feeling too rigid. So that's really impressive. Um, visibility is really good. I really like, I really like the style and design of the interior. There were a few things with, you know, like where was this menu function hidden? And I, it would probably improve with familiarity, but like a couple of times the Bluetooth disconnected for no reason. Yeah. And they told me this is a really early prototype mm-hmm. car. It's car number one Oh five. It's okay. really early. Um, they, I had some complaints about little tech stuff like that, consistency of things, and they said that there's been multiple updates, and they promise that a production uh, car uh, will would not have these issues. But so I give them a little more credit. True, we should. Yeah, I'm um, glad you said that. As like yeah. the, the uh, qualifier. Keep going for a second. Let me just check. Okay. The doorbell go twice. Let me make sure someone's on that. Um, other things I noticed there were funny little things like. I didn't know if the car was locked or not when I was sitting in it. And because of just, I mean, this is things you'd learn if you own it, but like the only way to know what the lock indicator means is when the door handles are down. Like yeah. when they're folded in, then you know that the car is locked. Uh, I like the controls. I wish there were, you know, the, um, the, the controls on the steering wheel for like the volume and tuning and things are the springs on them are rather stiff. So I think they're they're designed where you hold the wheel at, you know, at nine and three, and then you just move your thumbs up and down. Yeah. But the springs are actually kind of stiff to do that. You have to really grab them. So like adjusting the volume is not that convenient. You don't do it a lot, but like there's just little things like that. I actually found I myself adjusting the volume a lot. Really? I think considering the stereo has like the Dolby Atmos thing in it, I thought it was only okay. I agree. And, I was surprised. And I found myself, especially with podcasts and talking stuff, having to go, having to really adjust volume mm. all the time. And that was that was mildly annoying. Stereo was kind of uh, tinny. And I didn't, yeah. um, 
I went back to the Maki this morning after a week with the Lucid, and although I love the massage seats and I really like the way the Lucid drives and rides and all that stuff, it's so refined and fast. Mm -hmm. In a, in a more ways than one, I really appreciated the simplicity of the Ford, just like how straightforward some basic functions were. CarPlay, right? I mean, to to get used to CarPlay and then have it taken away sucks. <laughs> yeah, um, it really feels like the fact that Lucid, Rivian, and Tesla do not have CarPlay and do not have satellite radio sucks. That that super super sucks. And like their navigation system is feels a little old. I mean, the screen looks good, but so I, I you know I use their nav to go somewhere, and I saw the route, and I was like. I don't know if that's a good idea. And I pulled up Google Maps on my phone and it had a totally different direction that saved me 15 minutes. Like we kind of forget that's one of the benefits of using Google Maps or somewhere, other things like that. I told the Lucid guys about this too. I yeah. said, if you're not going to allow us to use our apps with CarPlay, then your GPS needs to be superior. And to give Tesla credit, their onboard GPS is excellent. You can zoom out and look at the whole city, real time traffic. You know, you can you can see the hot spots to avoid whatever. With the Lucid, you program a route, and I didn't. In most cases, I did not double check it against my phone. Um, I figured it avoided the traffic at least based on that very moment. Mm -hmm. But then it didn't show the red on the line. You know what I mean? Right. The, the, my route line was blue, but it didn't show yellow or red. Or, you know, the traffic conditions on the line where Google Maps, and I was like, guys, pretty basic. We need a traffic real time, not just make the route based on traffic, but real time indicators of you are approaching a fucking red zone yeah. on the freeway right now. And it's right ending now. eventually. Yeah. You, know, you want to see that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, it's I, very I, slick, but there's some things like that that would probably get frustrating over time. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's some things about the car that are really just tech for tech's sake mm -hmm. and not because it's actually better. I mean, I, I have to say that, like, Tesla's UI is really good, except for the lack of CarPlay and the lack of satellite radio. Ford's has both of those things in a also very slick tablet um, where the controls and the, the stuff you're doing with them are really, really straightforward. Granted, the, the Lucid ha has more shit in it. Mm -hmm. It's got the massage seats and other functions that Ford doesn't have, change the themes and all this other stuff. But th getting through menus to different functions were, was definitely a little clunkier in the yeah. Lucid than it was in the Rivian <clears throat> or in, uh, in a Tesla. And I think some of that is... You know, they have that two screen setup in the Rivian, or sorry, in the uh, the Lucid. So the larger screen down in the center console and then the thin one in the front. But the fact that you can like move things from top to bottom, I never found myself doing that because the bottom screen is so much larger. Yeah. I don't want to bring information that seems presented down there very well and then put it on a smaller screen. Right. Um, and like the nav screen isn't that big because it's on that, that thinner thing. It's almost like that, that's what Porsche uses just for like their dashboard in terms of size yeah. for the Taycan. When but I then was they road tripping the GPS, the big screen was good for typing the, the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And then once I had the root up, it would be up on the top screen. Um, and then I'd have the the bottom screen for changing the, the climate control and right. stuff like that. Yeah, that's what but I, I didn't necessarily need to regularly move shit between the two screens aside from the keyboard is on the big one. That's all. The, you could just limit it to the keyboard is on the big one. And that's really fine. You know, it doesn't need Did to Did you be... notice uh, wind noise on the left side? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, me too. I think that's I think that's a pre pro, pre -pro situation. Thing. Yeah. Cool. When you go when you're going fast, there was some wind noise and that may have had something to do with why I was adjusting the volume all the time. Mm, yeah. Um because I, I noticed it like sixty miles an hour, not yeah, like they, hundred and they were sure they said they assured me that the production cars would not have that issue. That that's a pre pro issue. That's the thing with driving these very early cars. Like I I don't know where to criticize and where to like let this one go. Right. Um, well, I mean, we'll see on the production version. I, mean, I think yeah. ultimately they got things like ride propulsion. Great. I like the packaging, the space inside. I like the design of the front. Although I like the design of the rear less and less the more I see it. Frankly. Um, 
And but I'm I'm just excited that I feel like they rethought things a bit compared to what other other stuff is out there. Yeah. And it seems like they've executed a lot of the I guess I would say foundational parts of a car pretty well. But as we've talked about before, as cars as more and more cars go electric, the separation of how they drive is sure. going to shrink. So the how well the, all the systems in them operate is going to be more important. I mean, purely from a dynamics perspective, because I went up to the, the the bumpy canyon road, the one that we like, the very fast and very bumpy canyon road. Um, the acceleration is so is so hardcore that I made myself kind of nauseous doing it. For yeah, I did three launches in a row, and I felt ill afterwards. So there's no question that that is a high functioning system. I also allegedly did over 160 miles an hour on that road in the fucking Lucid. Allegedly, of course. Uh, you'll never find evidence of it, but I did. Allegedly. Um, <laughs> I believe it. Um, on the very bumpy stuff, same thing with Mach-E GT, the front and rear motors, if you do not fully disable traction control, you can get a little hiccup. You know, where it will like kind of give you a little jarring sensation if the front wheels have traction and the rear wheels lose traction, you'll get that kind of jar mm. um, that was a point against for the Mach E. Same thing that happened with this car did not happen in Tycon Turbo S. Tycon, if, I, if you're talking about dynamics and really driving and pace, the Tycon Turbo S is the, is the gold standard of this kind of shit. It's a Porsche. I mean, it right. rides, drives, handles, feels like a Porsche. Um, the, the 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 Lucid is much more in the vein of an A8 or a an S class, where it's a big luxury sedan. It's not meant to be a super sport sedan. And so, when you start to push it at the limits of grip, where you're loaded up, and then you hit a bump mid corner at really at pace, or if you're f fucking sending it and you're really doing threshold braking, you know, there was a couple instances where, you know, like all these massive power cars, you could have an enormous crash. Oh yeah. I mean, you could be at literally entering a corner that in a regular sports car might be 60 or 70 miles an hour. You might be doing 120, 130 in this car if you're not careful. So you're really leaning on these brakes. If there's a bump in the braking zone, the thing fucking shudders like a motherfucker. Mm. Like it, like it. It's not. It's it 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 shudders because you get a tiny little bit of lockup, of like skip lockup in the front wheel, right. followed by the rear wheel. Go, uh, and you and the car is like whoa 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 whoa. It just doesn't know how to deal with that, in a way that mechanically connected all wheel drive systems kind of do. Right. You know. I also had a thing today. Uh, where I was driving on the highway and you know I merged between two cars and the automatic braking system engaged not because I was going to hit the car it was just like you're close it was like that's how you merge in Los Angeles yeah. but Ford is the worst at that but as My it, as it slowed down sucks. I got on the brake and it was almost like the auto braking system was more in command of the braking than I was hmm. like it had set let's call it 70% pressure and I was like well I'm going to use more pressure than that and it wasn't adding oh, it for a second weird. it was just an interesting interaction like between you know was the your cruise control on or no no oh weird yeah um you know in in general it's a it's a nice place to spend your time it's mm -hmm. a great thing to eat up miles um uh, i think i said this in the last cruise show i think so didn't i didn't we well, yeah when we were, i was at home um that the benefit of having this 450 mile range is not actually doing 450 miles it's doing 300 miles at 90 miles an hour right that's, with all the ac on yeah you. that's what it's really about it's about being able to go from la to vegas or to san francisco uh or most of the way to phoenix at a speed that is commensurate with what you would do in a at panamera or an s class you know the only the trucks are going 72 miles an hour on these freeways. If you spend 170 grand on a luxury car, only to be stuck doing 72 to get the range to get there, you'd feel like an asshole. Mm. Which is sometimes how I feel in the Mach E going to Vegas. Is I if if I I now that I've done it a couple of times, I know I set the cruise at 73, which will get me the range I need, but everybody's flying by me. Right. And I go, and if I really drive the speed 
that everyone else is driving that, yes, is above the speed limit, but is certainly not immoral. Just the speed everyone else, the sp- that traffic is 80 to 90 miles an hour. My range is reduced by 25, 30% at that. Right. And so having this big range is not about actually using the big range. It's about having 300 miles an hour, or excuse me, 300 miles at 90 miles an hour and really feeling like you're in a luxury car because you can do that. Right. Yeah. Which it does. Yeah. Which it will do. Which it does. It does feel like a luxury yeah. car. Um, but it was nice of Lucid to let us keep the car through my, uh, through my sickness. Uh, so that I could go make the video yeah. uh, yesterday. I certainly appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, and, you, and you ended up having an extra car. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the the the, uh, the public charging thing, I, I was talking over a DM with John Volker, who I follow on Twitter, um, who writes a lot about EVs, and he wrote a great piece for The Drive. Uh, it was fucking like 4,000 words uh, last week about the charging network and what people are doing. And it seems like there are massive incentives for building out the charging network and very little budget for maintaining the existing chargers. Oh boy. It's about bragging how big your network is, bragging how many chargers you have, being the most, that being tied to your stock price or your federal subsidies or whatever, and it is not about the function, make the actual functionality, and and really spending the resources to make sure that the chargers that you have already are down for the minimum amount of time possible, and that communicating with your users is a priority. The funds are absolutely only allocated to building new chargers and not to maintenance, customer service, and stuff like that. That is actually much more important beyond a certain. Core yeah. number of chargers. Well, and you'd think that the company that built the things would then want to do a good job running the company. Yeah, um, but they the, they can they can say to the media that they are improving. Right. There's no real accountability. There's some independent testing, and they found that everybody fell short. But there's no real accountability. Yeah. Um, mm. And there's no the federal funding is not tied tied to. You know, well, of course, it's not going to be tied to the Yelp score of the charger. It's yeah. tied to are you building a thousand the, chargers yeah. to help this, you yeah. know, this situation? Oh yeah. wow, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, so that's so that's so that. And that explains why when I went to charge it, I called you because one of the chargers didn't work and the other one did. And yeah, I was like ah, this is yeah. these are the things you've been complaining these about. These are the things. This is what my life has been for yeah. the last four weeks has been chargers fucking up. Yeah, you know, left and right. Um. Anyway. Uh, that is the, um, extent of my notes for today, which is good because it's been an hour and 12 minutes and we have lots of questions from the Patreon. Get on that patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast. If you are interested in asking us questions on the show, if you're interested in joining the live programs, if you're interested in catching the show the same day it's recorded, not waiting till Tuesday and Thursday, and even if you are uh, interested in extra TST podcasts, an extra show every month, yeah. Did I say ad-free? I might have already said ad-free, but let's go to the show. Um, <clears throat> Nate M. is looking, has a Ford Explorer ST uh, with bolt-ons and tunes made 500-wheel horsepower. Wow. Okay. Lacks any sort of character. Looking to trade to a fun sedan, fifty to sixty thousand dollars with a stick, used F eighty M three. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, sedans with a stick are incredibly. You you're choosing from f- three. You get a Cadillac CT four V or five. Which one is it? The smaller one. Well, those are. I mean, those start at seventy grand. Oh. Yeah, you're not getting a, bla- a CT four Blackwing. You're talking about a used F80 M3. I mean, that's, that's what you should get. That's what's in that p- price point. I mean, what else is there? Make can you get an? S, when was the last S4 you could get with a stick? A long time. A ago. long time and ago. Mercedes basically never. Mercedes did has it. no sticks. Yeah. I mean, fifty, sixty thousand. I mean, you want a you want a seven year old Chevy SS? I mean, is that really? That would be fun, um, but I mean. Stri- yeah, I mean, yeah, that's it. It's like there's SS no, and M3. Yeah, there's so few sedans with a manual that are in that, and in that price point, there's nothing new. So you're no, talking right. about 
depreciated, something that was 75 or 80 and is depreciated. The game you're playing is how old are you willing to drive? Like you could go to E39 M5, but if you're used to having a newer car sure. like Explorer ST, you're probably going to enjoy the F80 M3 more because it's got tech yeah. and all that crap. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, you you could go a, a lot older. You know, there's that's true. But um, yeah, limited, lim, very limited options between that that price range. It would be easier if he said under forty grand. Then I'd say, well, just get a WRX, you know, or or something. That's but, true. But you could go down market and save some money. You know, fifty, sixty grand will get you a great STI or a great Evo, and you could modify it. But like. You know, it's not going to be luxurious, and it won't have any anywhere near the space the Explorer did. Right, that's a much larger car. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh boy, that was a carryover from Spin Show. I don't want that one. Okay, and then we, um, uh, and then starting here down are new. Okay, Miguel Flores. Uh, since Porsche gave us the Cayenne and Macan, they paved the way for fun stuff like the GT cars and the variants. With that in mind, do you think Mitsubishi might be able to bring themselves back into relevance? No. Uh, Mitsubishi SUVs are everywhere, and I'm wondering if it makes me wonder if that may enable them to bring back the fun stuff. Well, so I looked up Mitsubishi's sales for like annual sales. Um, they are doing better, mm. but they are still significantly down from where they were in the heyday. Wow. So they peaked at what? 345,000 cars in, in 2002. 2002. That's 18 or 20 years ago at this point. Right. And so that's when they were building what Evos they go down? and all what kinds they, of stuff. What are they at now? The, now they have come back oh, okay. they're at about 102. So the minimum was 53,000 in 09. Yeah, it was real bad. Wow. Was very bad. That was before the Evo 10 even came out. How about that? So now they're at uh, 102,000. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, it's still 30% of their best. So I think it'd still be a really challenging business case for them to put a bunch of money into that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'd like to know. I mean,. Was the Evo ever like really like a volume car? I mean, mm -hmm. is that how what how much of their sales are driven by Evo? I mean, not that much. And more importantly, think about how many. I mean, there's like a lot. Of, if you have a Porsche GT car as your weekend car, the odds are pretty high that your daily is also a Porsche. Mm -hmm. or your spouse's daily is also a Porsche. So many Macan and Cayenne buyers also have a Porsche sports car in the weekend. If you have an Evo, are you going to also have an Outlander <laughs> right. or an Endeavor, you know, every 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 whatever every day? So like I just don't see that. And the existence, I think the existence of the Porsche GT cars does help convert a lot of people to GTSs and C4Ss and like other Porsches right. and even to Taycan. Like it works. So much of their branding is look at our really good fast stuff. Right. But the success of an Evo is not going to send people to buy their minivan or their sedan or their Outlander. Yeah. 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 Um, I, and I just don't think they care. I mean, they stopped investing. You know, the last time they invested money into the Evo was 12 years ago. They they're not investing into any sedans at all, you know. Um, oh, someone in the comments said a BMW 340i is also a good sedan option and cheaper no. than, than an M3. That yeah, is a good okay. point. That could work. Yeah, 340i, sure. Uh, what are other? Uh, let's see. Okay, Matt Cheseldean. I recently did an extreme experience track day. Oh, uh, that's one of those like kind of theme park ride kind of places. Uh, three laps in a Lambo Huracan Evo. I was told I wasn't allowed to shift manually because the rear steer in the car is unpredictable in manual mode and that I could crash it as it tends to have mind of its own. Uh, that's not true at all. They they were 100% lying to you. The rear steer is has absolutely nothing to do with whether you're in manual and automatic mode. I, I, I think whoever was your instructor or whoever's in charge of that program is on a very lowest common denominator situation there, and they're trying to keep their cars running however that, they can, yeah. and they, they've they experienced people that have, I mean, I don't know how you damage a Huracan in manual mode. I mean, I guess you could hit red line, but like you, you can't 
break it. Like right, I, they probably just want to prevent the number of times that car hits red line. And if yeah. people shift manually, it would probably do it a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Randy says opinion on the Piaget Altiplano series of watches. Um, the um, the ultimate concept is an amazing engineering achievement. Are the regular Altiplano S and automatics worthy of a place in a collection? These are very thin watches. They're like they're like two millimeters uh, thin. Like Whoa. literally, like a like a like some of the. I mean, the regular one. Go go down. See, so those that one, the ultimate concept. Whoa. Yeah, look at that thing. It's like the thinness of like a nickel. That's crazy. Pretty That's crazy. Impressive. Yeah, the whole movement is on one level. Um, I don't really think much about Piaget watches. Um, if you're into their styling, they are certainly uh, a very high quality item um, from Switzerland. They're made well. They have an interesting history. Um, and the Altiplano stuff is super, super, I mean, the, the, the ultimate Altiplanos, which are the very, very thin ones, are really cool. I mean, other than that, they're they're simple dress watches like the Patek Calatravas, and it's not the kind of thing that I think about. But if you wear a suit a lot, if you're in a formal setting and looking for a dress watch, look at that fucking thin that thing. Is Isn't so that crazy? Thin. Wow. Yeah. Bulgari just came out with an even thinner one, 1. 1.8 millimeters. Wow. Um, it's very, very crazy. I like the quest for thinness. I think that's very interesting. That's a very interesting... Um, Cool engineering exercise. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they're not. I mean, they're not. They're not for me. But if you're into dress watches, then sure. Yeah, okay. Um. Uh. Let's see. D W B F eleven. Dad wants an electric car to replace his aging Lexus ES. Favorite electric car in the sixty k range. Um. I. I mean. I. I've. I've liked my Mach E. I mean, I really do. I've heard, I've heard that some people with the Polestar Two really like that. You've obviously got a you know Tesla Model Y if you're interested in that. Um, but I mean, my Mach E was fifty three thousand and change. Um, it would be like fifty seven thousand, I think, if you got the all wheel drive. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little less, maybe fifty five, fifty six. And I, I mean, I I recommend it to people all the time, and I'm recommending it to you. Uh, my garage, oh, my garage bay. Did I drive the base Z? Uh, wants to know, are the seats worth the upgrade? The seats themselves are the same. It's you get leather and um, leather and ultra suede, um, which, you know, it it certainly feels like a more premium car. it's it's it feels like an upgraded interior. Um, and worth the word worth. It's not like you can get just the seats. You have mm -hmm. to get the whole, the whole package. Right, and he I, says he's not going to do any track use, so you, like you don't need the LSD and the brakes and things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it feels like a much nicer place to spend your time. If you were doing some kind of a build or really on a budget, then the base one wasn't terrible, but it was just black cloth and like Nissan black cloth like is not like the best. It's not. I've been in rented Altimas and rented Rogues and stuff like that, and it's not exactly luxurious, whereas the materials in the premium are much higher end and nice and, in some cases, really fun colors like that crazy blue mm -hmm. uh, interior. Um, it was nice. Aiden Squires, how did I decide on the smoking tire? The smoking tire took a long time to think of. It literally took like six months to think of. The thing about... It matters less now. Um, people now, the strategy, if you have a channel or a website or whatever, is just to use your name. You know, like people whose channel is just their name, they, they, they tend to be very successful. But when we first started this, it was, it was, um, it was important to have a name that is, that was like, didn't you, you could have the wet, the website had to be available, right? With no weird punctuation, no weird spellings, like mm -hmm. it had to be the words were available. And then I come from uh, a world of s guide surfing, cable guide surfing, and you wanted, I wanted a name that you would see it, if you thought about it on a guide, you'd see it, you'd know what you were getting, but it was also kind of witty. And at the time I was reading the website, The Smoking Gun, which is a website that I haven't looked at in quite a long time, but it's where you have the um, 
it's where they have all the concert tour writers and you'd learn all the demands that musicians and artists wanted in their backstage dressing rooms, the Van Halen brown M&Ms thing, all the tour writers. And I was reading that and I thought it was fun. And I, I like the double, like we were talking earlier in the show, like Hoonicorn, mm-hmm. the smoking tire is a double entendre of the smoking gun in terms of giving you this inside information and tires in terms of doing burnouts. And I thought that if you saw the name The Smoking Tire, that it would be kind of witty and funny and also would imply what you would get at the other end of it. The inside look at the world of cars? Right, yeah. Um, James Cowley, have I seen people scraping the white paint off their license plate? Uh, no, I've never seen that. I have in not, you. and I I've Googled it. I've seen old shitty license plates where it like has chipped off. Well, the only thing I could find was like articles saying that people are either trying to scrape or dissolve the reflective coating off the license plate so that red light cameras and toll booths won't be able to like shoot, you know, hit them with the flash yeah. and then read the, the plate. Maybe that, if that's what you're going to do, trend. just take your plate off and yeah. come up with an excuse if you get pulled but over. They sell those to, tint covers people rock and like yeah. I guess they don't get in trouble for it. I don't it. think that works at all. Oh. <laughs> no, no, the tint covers, they might, but I don't know, but they're illegal, but they might work. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't sit there scraping paint off your license plate. No, I would just, I would just use $4 and yeah. pay, pay the toll or just wait in line. Uh, um, Zach Martin says, Zach, any regrets that buying one. the M3, Zach? Do you wish you bought another car completely? No, I can't, I can't think of something that would do as many things as well as it does which is what their market, I mean, that's why they sold well. But yeah. do I wish I, so I don't wish I bought another car, but I'm going to buy another car <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to have a pair. Yeah. Uh, and best driving experience Porsche ever, uh, the demand GT4, uh, GT4.5. That's why uh, they're doing my car. My car will be even better than the GT4.5 because it will be a convertible and it will have comfort seats. Uh, David Zumat, um Zach, having just driven my current car, manual M3 sedan, and the car I'm considering getting next, RS3, thoughts on the switch? If you're not chasing power, I mean, I mean, I well, I test drove the car for 40 minutes, so I kind of, I, I'm not going to learn anything more than you would learn on that test drive. I think the downsides of an Audi ownership are owning it out of warranty can get expensive. Um, this car seemed fairly robust given the miles on it and what other people have done with the platform. But I mean, that's, that's the only downside. Like I found it to be very comfortable. It still felt modern inside because they, those are like the minimal interior days mm-hmm. and the screen disappears, the pop-up screen on the dash, which is actually a really nice function. Mm-hmm. So if you don't want to look like every other car these days with a pop-up screen, like it disappears and it just looked like a really simple shape that I think will keep looking good for a long, long time. Um, but that's, that's all I know about them. Uh, sure. James says, what ridiculous factory option would you spec, real or fiction, if cost was no object? Um, I was at, when I visited Koenigsegg, um, they were building an Agera R for a gentleman in China who wanted gold, strands of gold woven into the carbon fiber. Oh, yeah. Actual gold, gold foil turned into a thread and part of the weave and had gold woven in the carbon fiber. Um, that was crazy, but but I think the most the best factory option is the Rolls-Royce Shooting Star ceiling. It's real. It's expensive. It's not the most egregious example. Bugattis and Koenigsegg mm-hmm. have crazier options than that. But there's if you've never experienced, the Starfield ceiling is one level, but an animated Starfield ceiling with shooting star, that's as G as it gets. It's pretty good, yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, fiction, like, I, I can't imagine, like, we have everything these days. Yeah. All I wanted was selectable all-wheel drive and drift mode, and that exists now. They have that now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I that's have every, pretty cool. You know, I, yeah. you know that, that's it. All right. Well, that's our show. Thank you for joining us today. On Friday, we've got Nick and Giles English, the founders of Braemont Watches, are coming to studio. I'm also I'm touring them around L.A. I'm taking them up to Good Vibes Friday morning. I've got a 911 GTS that should be very fun. And uh, 
uh, yeah, that's it. So get your questions in on the Patreon if you want to ask Nick and Giles English of Bremont about watches or what it's like to sponsor a Formula One team. That should be an interesting topic of conversation because they're a title sponsor for Williams Racing. Uh, very cool stuff. And um, I'm going to end it right now because I really have to pee. All right. Bye.